Matthew chapter 16, and we'll pick up the text here in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And He said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but My Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build My church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so Father, we pray that You would would be pleased to meet with us in this hour by Your Spirit. Lord, I pray You'd help give me liberty. Give us ears to hear, heart to apply Your Word. Lord, give us a greater understanding and appreciation of Your church. Well, we thank You for the church of God. We thank You for... Lord, it pleased You to make us members of it. Living stones, Lord. We, we want to honor You. We want to please You. We want to know more of Your Word, Lord. We pray, please edify Your people. Please save souls. Please work in our midst. Lord, be with the brethren back there teaching the children. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so this is part two of my biblical overview of church membership. And what's probably going to be more parts, probably a series. I don't don't even know how many it's going to be, but... I uh, I realize that <laughs> there's a lot to the subject and there's a lot I want to discuss this morning that just really is sort of foundational again. But I spent the bulk of my time in the last message laying down a foundation for today's message and you know establishing what the word church means, how it's used, pointing out how we use several you know precious and vital truths of the Christian faith terms that that, that don't show up in Scripture. Nonetheless, they're absolutely true the words like trinity and words like missionary and incarnation and membership although member does show up in scripture we establish in that message of the word church itself and the way the bible speaks of it speaks of a visible called out group of recognizable identifiable believers gathered together in one assembly that's the church that's The Bible's primary use of the word church. Now, I had us open up to Matthew 16 because it's where the church, the term church first appears, is introduced to us in Scripture. And this is significant because Jesus lays down some very important fundamental realities about the church here that many 21st century American Christians simply do not understand, especially those who are young believers. Verse 18, On this rock I will build My ecclesia, My called out ones. As we read, Peter boldly makes this proclamation about Jesus which from our perspective is a no-brainer. I mean, yeah, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But at that moment in time, combining all the social, cultural, historical aspects bearing down upon these men in that day, this statement was not such a no-brainer. In fact, that statement, Jesus says it. Flesh and blood did not reveal that. It was not so apparent. And yet it was a statement that did come out of flesh and blood. And Jesus responds to it with very high commendation. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. And I tell you, you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia. 
And this passage has been much cause for wrestling in my own soul and with this text and with my forefathers. And, and honestly, before the Lord, I just had to finally surrender and wave the white flag that I've been wrongly interpreting this text. I'd never studied the passage before. I was simply coming to it to use verse 19 to help establish a point that I'm going to eventually get to here. But once I started looking more closely at verse 18, I quickly became aware that I'd simply been towing the line with all my other Protestant brothers who do with this passage, which what I now believe amounts to just poor exegesis and effort to evade controversial claims that find their origin in this text. Now, is, is the correct interpretation here essential or critical to arrive at the point I want to make? No, but because it caused me so much consternation, you're, you're coming along on the ride with me here. <clears throat> and if you're not aware of it, this is the go-to text for the Catholic religion in their establishment of popery. Peter being the first pope. And if you already knew that, let me ask you, when I read this, did Catholicism... Are popery enter your mind at all? Be honest. Catholicism takes Jesus' words to Peter here and somehow in some way turns them into a papal system of their own liking and their own making that is nowhere to be found here. Let me assure you, there's no papacy in any way, shape, or form in these words here. But, sadly, I'm convinced that most Protestants are guilty of being so intent on disproving the biblical authority for the office of the Pope that they end up making conclusions here that are outside what the text is saying. Now, not all Protestants do this, but the majority of them do. I mean, good men, solid men, in my opinion, so bent on removing Catholicism from the text, they can't properly see what the verse is saying. <clears throat> And about half the camp ends up here. Half the camp says that the, the rock here is being referred to as, as the confession that Peter makes. That the truth of Jesus being Christ, the Son of God, that truth is the rock whereby the church is built upon. Now, while that, that may be a true statement, most certainly is a true statement about Christianity, I don't believe that's what Jesus is referring to here. Not completely. The other half maintains that the rock being referred to here is none other than Jesus Himself. After all, there's plenty of Scriptures to back this idea that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. He's the cornerstone. He's the sure foundation. There's no question about those biblical realities. That's why I never questioned this interpretation. I mean, that's the position I held to prior to studying this passage. I, I think I've even mentioned it in passing in, in certain messages. <laughs> but I, I just cannot, in all honesty put confidence in that rendering anymore and personally I think those who both come up with just the, the, the interpretation of it solely being the message are solely referring to Jesus Christ there I, I believe there are well-meaning attempts to arrive at what's being said here but sadly I think those attempts are clouded just by the felt need of making this subject matter anything but Peter because of what Catholics do with it I mean, the text can't mean Peter because of the Catholics. Oh, oh no, the Catholics. Catholics what? I mean, you, you read some commentaries from, from very good men. They spend more time telling you what this text doesn't mean or doesn't say trying to renounce Catholicism than simply tell you what the text is saying and what it refers to. Matthew Henry. Love him. Great commentary. I highly recommend him. But... This is Matthew Henry's comment. Nothing can be... I mean, you talk about... Tim was talking about dogmatic assertions. Christians are, are guilty of the same, by the way. Making dogmatic assertions. Nothing can be more wrong... That's a strong statement. Nothing can be more wrong than to suppose that Christ meant the person of Peter was the rock. Without doubt, Christ Himself is the rock, the tried foundation of the church. And woe to him that attempts to lay any other. Peter's confession is this rock as to doctrine. But all pretensions of any man either to absolve or attain men's sins are blasphemous and absurd. None can forgive sins but God only. Sounds like the Pharisees. 
See where he goes with that? John Gill. Peter, as an apostle, had no successor in his office. Nor was he bishop of Rome, nor pope of Rome, either his office or his doctrine. But here, by the rock, is meant either the confession of faith made by Peter, it containing the prime articles of Christianity, and which are as immovable as a rock, or rather Christ Himself. You see what Gill does there? He begins with what it cannot possibly be because of where it takes his mind. It can't possibly be referring to the person of Peter because that leads to the false doctrine of popery. So then, it, well, it's got to be one of these other two. And it's as it's if brethren come to this text and fear that if the rock refers to Peter, then suddenly it makes Catholicism some irrefutable force that just can't be reckoned with. Why well, that mean there's a pope? We can't have a pope, so we can't have Peter being the rock. And no, that, that, that's not what it means at all. It doesn't have to mean that. I mean, you have to do all kinds of creative reasoning to come up with a pope, period. You don't need to concern yourself with the, with, with the pope showing up here. I mean, there's a lot of verses in the, in the Bible we could go to. You really only need one, Galatians chapter 2, right? Galatians chapter 2, what happens? Paul opposes Peter to his face and exposes his hypocrisy. There's your goodbye, pope, right? There goes your sinless, infallible man. Exposed right there. I mean, the Catholic religion is chocked so full of unbiblical doctrine, we hardly need to concern ourselves with dismissing the Pope in this text. <clears throat> anyway, let's look at the text. How did I arrive at Peter being the rock? Well, not to sound too simplistic. <laughs> Or insulting or prideful, or, but I simply read the text. I mean, and I read it again. And I actually did what you're supposed to do let the text speak for itself. And I put myself in the story. Here's Peter. I'm in Peter's shoes, a common fisherman standing in the midst of the other common men, having a conversation with someone who's everything but common. A man who demonstrated time and time again he had authority over creation, over sickness, over death. These men had witnessed him make bread out of nothing, walk on water, you know, make a tempest, complete calm, cast out demons, raise people from the dead, all leading up to this moment. And while it certainly rocked them and wowed them, and they were men, they still had uncertainties, they still had questions. They just, who is this man? And now the time has come. Revelation time. Time for these men to know who this man really is. So Jesus starts the conversation. He says, who, who do men say that I am when you're out, out and about? What, what are they saying? And you, can, you can almost hear the laughter. in there. <laughs> some, are, some are saying you're John the Baptist and this other guy was saying you're Elijah and they got people, some people saying you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And, and then Jesus drops the big question. The silencer. Right in the middle of this exchange going on between the disciples, sharing with all kinds of different testimonies. But who do you say that I am? And we're not specifically told there's a pause here, but it's certainly not hard to imagine there was one. It's kind of like when Brother Randy was standing up here, right? And he throws out there, Is God easy or hard to please? You notice how long there was a pause? <laughs> why, why is that? because you don't want to give the wrong answer. There's a, some level of uncertainty. You can believe that was there with Jesus. So Peter steps up to the plate and confidently says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the other disciples are looking at Peter and looking at themselves and waiting for Jesus to respond. And Jesus' response is, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. And you, you are Peter, the rock. You see what Jesus does there? He makes a parallel statement in response to Peter. Peter, you have rightly identified me as the Christ. Now let me rightly identify you before all your brothers. You see, there's a, there, Simon, there's a reason why I renamed you Peter when we first met. Way back when I first called you. It was for this very moment right here. This moment right here. 
I am the Christ, you are correct. And you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And if you, if you lay aside all presuppositions here that this can't be Peter, well, then you, you, fun, finally, you suddenly find yourself saying, wow, that, that actually sounds like Jesus is speaking to Peter about Peter. Because He actually is. <laughs> if we're just honest with the basic grammar, Jesus is using the personal pronoun you referring to Peter. I tell you that you are Peter. Jesus is not addressing Peter's confessional truth calling at you. He's not addressing himself calling at you. He's addressing Peter and calling Peter you. It's pretty plain in the text. In fact, Jesus' reiteration, you are Peter, you are a rock, it is pretty clear indicator that Jesus is addressing Peter. By mentioning his name, it appears that Jesus is now addressing or highlighting for Peter and for all those disciples there standing there. And for us here today, the reason behind Jesus giving Simon, that name Peter, as you most know, as I already mentioned, it's because his name, that name means rock. Again, this is where people desperately start looking for a clue to get Peter off the hook. Get him, get him, get him out from being the object of Jesus addressing here. We've got we to somehow, we somehow explain this away. So, oh yeah, yeah, it's two different Greek words. There's Petros and Petra. You see, he's not talking about Peter, he's talking about himself. They'll be quick to point out that Petros is, means little rock and Petra means big rock. And when that's not actually what they mean. And yet, out of zeal to silence Catholicism, people read into the verses here those two definitions. Petros means rock, not little rock, not pebble. Yeah, but you know, we've we got to reduce Peter here. He's, he, we got to keep him little. You know, we've we got to keep Peter small and insignificant because that's what he is. And yes, no doubt, in the end of the day, in the grand scheme of things, Peter is just that. But that's the exact opposite of what Jesus is doing here in this text. Whether that fits nicely into our theology or not, that's not what Jesus is doing here. He is lifting Peter up before all and saying, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. That's not a statement of belittling Peter. That's a statement of exaltation and honor. Jesus is establishing something here. Take your papal hats and stained glass, Mary, and blow the incense smoke out of the way and see the text clearly because Catholicism's not in this at all. It's not. Peter is, though, being singled out and pronouncement is being made about him. Yes, there's, there's word play at hand here. Jesus uses both the masculine term Petros and the fe- with the feminine term Petra. Word play that perfectly fits the illustration that Jesus is creating here. He's not contrasting little rock with big rock. He's setting forth Peter as the honored, distinguished spokesman of that early church. The rock of that early church that would be first used of God to take this little ragtag group of 100 plus and suddenly multiply them into thousands. And use this same man to not only grow a church, a massive church in Jerusalem, filled with Jews, but also use this man to take the Gospel to the Gentiles. Isn't that exactly what we see played out in the book of Acts? Petros, the rock, is the the rock within the Petra, the bedrock of Christ's church. Well, when I was reading this, I started getting concerned because I'm (laughs) looking up all these commentaries. I'm I'm not finding a whole lot of company. Well, I came upon the Christian, Christian Holman Standard Bible Commentary. Albert Barnes too. You got uh, Albert Barnes. He's often my go-to guy. I don't know why I turned to, didn't turn to him first, but this is what Christian Holman Christian Standard Bible says. So you don't think I'm just out here in the left field all alone? Jesus' words presented a deliberate wordplay in the text, and it's probably the most controversial statement in Matthew. You are Peter, Petros, rock. On this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Upon this statement, the Roman Catholic Church has based its doctrine of Peter being appointed the first in a long line of popes. Jesus' statement of Peter's authority in the next verse provides the basis for the Roman Catholic Church's erroneous teachings regarding the authority of the papal office. And equally in error 
many Protestants have reacted against the Roman Catholic interpretation by going to the other extreme, allowing the rock Petra to mean anything but Peter himself. Matthew records, Matthew's record of Jesus' wordplay on Peter's name is significant. Petrus is a masculine singular noun. Petra is feminine. And while clearly related, they represent a distinction. The masculine singular form refers to Peter as one singular rock. The feminine form may be understood to represent a bedrock or a rock quarry. It is reasonable to understand Jesus' statement to mean that Peter was one rock, significant rock, amongst the rock quarry of the disciples. And that idea is not foreign to Scripture. Peter himself, in 1 Peter 2.5, calls Jesus and the believers living stones. Of course, Jesus being the chief cornerstone, making up this spiritual house, or as Paul calls it, a holy temple in, in, in Ephesians 2.19 and 20. There Paul refers not, not to Jesus, but to the apostles and prophets as the foundation of the church. Yes, he includes Jesus as the cornerstone. But it's significant that Paul calls the apostles and prophets the foundation, not Jesus. But you are fellow citizens, he says, with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, I mentioned Albert Barnes. This is what Barnes says. Some have supposed that the word rock refers to Peter's confession and that Jesus meant to say, upon this rock, this truth that thou hast confessed, I am the Messiah, and upon confessions of this form, all believers will build my church. Confessions like this shall be the test of piety. In such confessions shall my church stand amid the flames of persecution and the fury of the gates of hell, Others have thought that Jesus referred to Himself. Christ is called a rock in Isaiah 28, verse 16, and 1 Peter 2, 8. And it has been thought that He turned from Peter to Himself and said, upon this rock, this truth that I am the Messiah, upon Myself as the Messiah, I will build My church. Both of these interpretations, though plausible, seem forced upon the passage and avoid the main difficulty in it. Another interpretation is the word rock refers to Peter himself. This is, Barnes says, the obvious meaning of the passage. And had it not been that the church of Rome has abused it and applied to it what it was never intended, no other interpretation would have ever been sought for. Thou art a rock. Thou hast shown Thyself firm and suitable for the work of laying the foundation of the church. Upon Thee will I build it. Thou shalt be highly honored and thou shalt be first in making known the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles. And this indeed was accomplished. But Christ did not mean that the Roman Catholic, as the Roman Catholics say He did to exalt Peter to supreme authority above all other apostles and to say that He was the only one upon whom He would rear His church. No, not so. Yes, Peter, Peter would have his moment but he would soon fade off into the sunset, into silence after Acts chapter 12, right? He then hands the baton to Paul. But Peter was that significant rock, that human instrument whom it pleased the Lord to use in getting this holy temple of his started. And it's only in that sense that the church is regarded as a building. I mean, we do see that imagery in Scripture. And it's a building of Christ's own making. Christ is the builder. This thing's made up of living stones, human beings, a whole complete structure from top to bottom, individual human beings, a dwelling place for God, including Jesus Himself. The whole thing, the dwelling place for God. Okay, we spent enough time on that, but it's significant because of what Jesus says next, I think. Jesus is continuing with His building of the church talk here. Of which human instrumentality is a very significant factor. Now He's going to provide this fundamental foundational reality about His church. This church that He is building. 
these living, breathing stones that make up the whole thing, of which Peter serves as the chief pioneer stone, if you will. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, I want us, I want us to consider that term key that Jesus is using. That's, that's a very interesting term. And it only shows up a handful of times in the Bible. But you know what? The times it shows up are very significant. It, it, that term key is no light term. One such time is Isaiah 22, verse 22, where we find it used in a metaphorical expression of, regarding David's house. It says, And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. Clearly there, it expresses one to who has been given authority to open and to shut the doors of David's house. Or the house of David. Then we find Jesus referring to keys multiple times in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.18 I died. And behold, I live, or I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death in Hades. Revelation 3 7. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, referring to that passage in Isaiah 22. Revelation 9.1, the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Revelation 20, verse 1, and I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. That's how keys are presented to us in Scripture. They represent authority and the ability to unlock and open doors and to shut and lock doors. And not just any old door. We're talking about doors to the bottomless pit. Doors to the house of David, which no doubt is synonymous with the kingdom of heaven. Now now let's read our text again. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Forget what the Catholics say and what they do with this. Listen to what Jesus says here. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Make no mistake about it. Jesus right here is conferring or bestowing His own authority upon the church here in Matthew 16, verse 19. Yes, it's in the person of Peter at this moment and at this juncture and at the church's commencement, but you see this thing extends far beyond Peter. Don't let the devil and his popish schemes blind you to the authority that Jesus is establishing here. This is a statement intended for the church, which really doesn't come into fruition until Jesus is gone and the day of Pentecost comes. The one to whom all authority has been given in heaven and earth is the one granting such authority to the church to bind, to loose, to open, to shut. Keys that open and close eternal realms. Now, really, that's quite stunning and sobering. Listen, brethren, when it comes to the place, when it comes to when it comes to the place of making biblical decisions of handing an eternal soul over to Satan. That action's not only bound here on earth, it's bound in heaven. It's as if Jesus Christ Himself has done it. 
And it won't become unbound or unloosed until or unless the church loosens it. Yes, this has everything to do with church discipline. If you think that's being forced upon the text, just flip over a page to Matthew 18. You'll see it as plain as day. Jesus, Jesus uses this language again and He connects it to church discipline. Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that at every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There it is again. The statement, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector, that's, that's cast out language. That's, that's church discipline, discipline language. Disciplining out of the church. When those who profess to know God demonstrate that they don't on how they live their lives and by their inability to listen to the church. Notice the phrases. He does not listen. He refuses to listen to them. He refuses to listen even to the church. Notice how Jesus stresses even to the church. This institution to whom I've granted some serious spiritual authority, tell it to them. Tell it to them. And if that person at that point does not come clean and does not repent, well, Jesus says their relationship with the church needs to become like the relationship with a tax collector and a Gentile, a lost person. One who does not know or does not belong to God. One who's outside the church, not in the church. That's when it's time for the church to take the keys Open the door, push them out, shut the door, and lock it. And it's them and Satan now. And for those who take that lightly and scoff at it or ignore it or think it a little thing, Oh, it's no big deal. <laughs> I don't care what the church says. They, they can say what they want. Let's go to another church that accepts me. They're not going to point out my sin. and you know, They're going to love on me. And... My friend, that would be serious foolishness. You, you really need to hear what Jesus is saying here. It's binding. You see, what the church does here on earth is bound in heaven. I give you the keys, Jesus says. It's amazing, really. There are going to be some disciplined souls that enter into eternity that scoffed at the discipline, that ignored the discipline, that did not honor the discipline. You know what's going to happen come that eternal day? Jesus is going to say, you're under discipline in one of My churches. You have no entrance. That's what's going to happen. <clears throat> okay, for <laughs> those of you who thought, well, I thought we were going to talk about church membership. Well, we are. Really, we are. And maybe it took a little longer than I needed to bring us to this point, but this would be my first biblical principle that demonstrates how church membership is indeed a biblical concept. It's in the authority and the responsibility and the activity of church discipline that church memberships not only made visible, but I would argue is made necessary. Jesus giving keys makes the key owners responsible. Authority and power to let someone in or to shut and keep them out, it demands affirmation of who's who, doesn't it? <laughs> You got to know who is who. 
I mean, just who's a part of this thing? What, and who isn't? And who determines that? I mean, is this just some willy-nilly, unorganized, just come as you please, do as you want, you know, just real no accountability, people just come in with plastic smiles and, and recite a bunch of religious, shallow, superficial phrases and cliches, and there's no real commitment, and there's no real expectation. I mean, is that what the church life is supposed to be about? Not according to Jesus. No, this kind of authority granted and the serious nature of its consequences begs, it begs of absolute, clear, visible, called out, recognizable, identifiable believers, human beings, human beings that are in the church's best determination and estimation are either in or they're out. That's the power that Jesus is granting the church in giving them the keys. That's the door, as it were, between being a member of the church and being a member and, and not being a member. The affirmation of the church and their decision to bring you in the door, to bring you into their fold, into their number, into their assembly as one of their own. That's church membership. Someone who professes faith in Jesus Christ, as far as it's observable from their life, they, they seem to be measuring up to that profession. And, you know, the Lord Jesus has given the, the, the church the authority to say, we believe you're a child of God. Come on in. Join us. Fellowship with us. Enter into our body. Join us in serving King Jesus. That's what we want. We want that. At the same time, Jesus has endowed the church with authority to make the judgment and say, we don't believe you understand the Gospel. And we don't believe your life measures up to the claims of the Gospel. So, so sorry. No, you cannot join us. We must bar the door here because... We believe you're not one of us. And this is more seen on the discipline side than it is on the receiving side. But <clears throat> and it's to remove the leaven from, from, from the church. To get it out because it doesn't belong there. And we could talk about baptism being uh, that doorway of entrance, but I don't want to get into the discussion of baptism. I'd, I'd rather keep that separate. But... <clears throat> But binding and loosening requires judgments being made. That's a dirty word in our day, isn't it? What or who? We have to ask ourselves: What or who requires binding? What I mean: What who who requires loose? And how, and how do we determine this? And what I mean: What situation would arise in a church that would would it would take such an action as that? And, and well, sin, right? Jesus plainly tells us in this. In, in Matthew 18, look at the example. Jesus says, if your, you start with your, if your brother sins. Here, here's the solution. If your brother sins. The church is made responsible by Jesus Christ to deal with known sin in its midst. There's no question about that. And we'll close the rest of our time looking at 1 Corinthians 5. Unfortunately, a passage we've become very familiar with in the last nine months. But I want to look at some some things we can glean from that about membership. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul begins by saying it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you. I mean, Paul's astonished by that. And listen to Paul's language right there. Among you. Among you. Paul has an expectation that there, there exists this identifiable you. And some people are among this you. And obviously there are those that are among it and there's those that are not among it, right? There's those that are a part of it and those that are not a part of it. But Paul says that we, there, there's sexual immorality among you and, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for a a man has his father's wife. And you're arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. You see, Paul fully expects these brethren to know. To know who this is. This isn't a mystery. They know who this man is. Why? Because he's among them, right? He's among them. He's part of them. He's part of this identifiable lump that Paul speaks of down in verses 6-8. through eight. 
He, he likens this church body, this particular membership of believers to a lump, this metaphorical lump of dough. Of which this sin-loving member is part of. Paul says, cut it away. Get it out. Remove it. Remove it from among you. Why? It sounds kind of harsh. That's not very loving, Paul. Because you see, sin spreads in the church like yeast spreads in dough or leaven. And God is interested in this temple that He's making to be pure and holy and honoring to His Son. And this church member that's among them is obviously living in sin. And the immediate response is not even that, that re repentance is not even really the issue at hand. It's the protection of the church body. It's the removal of this leaven from her midst. Don't let the dough ball get infected. That's what Paul's concerned about. Infection, psh, cut it out. Another infection, psh, cut it out. Keep the dough pure. Verse 3, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. There you see it. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my Spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. There again, Paul says, open the door, show him the way out, shut it and lock it. If he's a genuine believer... The Lord's going to take him down a path with Satan out there that he'll never forget. And in due time, he'll bring forth fruits, or uh, he'll bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. And Paul says his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord if he's a true believer. If he's not a true believer, then he didn't belong there in the first place. And brother, a church can only perform this action against one whom it can identify, right? and has authority over. I can almost hear someone raise the question, well, well, wait a minute, if this guy came to church regularly and he wasn't, what if this guy just, he was a regular visitor, he didn't come, you know, he, didn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't a member, a committed member, he just kind of showed up and... <laughs> you, you see, the problem, the problem most often in the people who question church membership is they view it through 21st century eyes and ironically enough they 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 actually oddly enough they, they think it's created through 21st century mindsets church membership but the reality is they're viewing it through 21st century eyeballs this concept has roots all over the new testament you see unlike today in america where it, in this day it actually cost you something to join yourself, to associate yourself, to be in the midst of the church. People just didn't show up and hang out or hang around it unless they meant business. You didn't identify with the church unless you were part of it. This was not a culture that was saturated in non-committed people just hanging around the church, seeing what they could benefit from it. They were identified. They were one of its members. This wasn't something questionable or, or uncertain people's status. And... But now I'm writing to you, verse 11, not, not to associate with anyone who bears the name brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? I mean, this, this talk is just deplorable today. Just to hear these words, it's like, what is this? Not associate? How can that be loving? Paul goes further here. He's saying it's not only enough to remove them from your meetings, but you need to determine not to associate with them. Don't, don't be interacting with them like everything's hunky-dory and... You know, let's go grab a burger. See how things are going in your life. That's not to say what you would encounter him. You, you couldn't turn into an evangelist or you're pressing him with repentance. Paul would not object to that. But 
is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. <laughs> you hear that? 21st century, rights-loving, freedom-waving, independent American? This requires judgment. Not from God, but from His church. Is not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Oh, the number of professing Christians that need to hear those words. That's Bible. That's the Scripture that says that. It's those inside the church that the church is supposed to judge. The church has been properly sanctioned or authorized by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself to make judgments here on earth. Judge righteous judgment, Jesus says. That's what we're called to do. Folks who don't know their Bible are quick, and I'm sure you've run into it evangelizing many times, and maybe relatives are quick to ignorantly cry out, Judge not! That you be not judged! I remember, I remember seeing Madonna on the TV one time. I don't know, in between, I don't know where she was at. But anyway, she, they, they just happened to catch her saying, He is without sin, let him cast the first stone. <laughs> oh, the devil's good, isn't he? Blinding people. But judge not that you be not judged is often quoted so out of context. First of all, people don't understand it in the context there. That statement is addressing personal judgments that flow from hypocrisy, not a church seeking to righteously and rightly honor the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a huge difference. And secondly, right in the context of those words, Jesus is warning us and telling them, beware of the dogs, beware of pigs. Don't, don't give them what's holy. <laughs> Now you tell me, how do I determine whether something's a pig or a dog? I turn my mind off? Or does that require me to make some kind of mental judgment in determining what is a pig and who is a pig and what is a dog and who is a dog? It requires judgment, right? There's a lot more we could say in that point. But and even drawing from that, we see that dogs and pigs, where are they? Not inside the church. They're outside the church. Dogs and pigs don't belong in the church. Who belongs in the church? Sheep belong in the church. Sheep are within God's church. Gathered in one identifiable flock that has shepherds who know and recognize who those sheep are. And I'm getting ahead of myself because we'll deal with that next. But In order for the church to make righteous judgments, it requires that the church be ever evaluating and observing her people, making appropriate assessments and responses that honor her Lord and Savior. Church discipline is part of that process and speaks loudly of committed membership. And it's designed by our Lord, the architect and builder of the church, to be a tool that helps keep it clear Keep it clearly identifiable, visible members. Pure, holy, and unspotted from the world. It's a tool aimed at removing those who are not sheep and restoring those who are. That's what discipline is. And we'll get more into this in our next message. But that very first church in Jerusalem, I mean, as large as that church became and that size... Those followers of Jesus Christ knew who they were. They knew who they were. There were those who were part of them, and those, there were those who were not a part of them. It was very clear. A person would hear the message, would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The church would take the keys and say, you're one of us, come on in, join us. Right? They'd get baptized. They'd, they would join and identify with that body, committing themselves to all the one another relationships we find in the New Testament, entering, to, entering into all the church's service and, and worship and joy and sorrow and trouble and persecution and whatever God would lead that church to do and to pursue. That's church membership. That's all over the New Testament. So next time we'll, we'll look at this, this in a couple different angles. Father, we thank You for the privilege 
Oh, Lord, the responsibility that You've given the church. Oh, Lord, let us be faithful. Help us be faithful. Help us honor You. Lord, we don't want to be a church. But we see some of the churches addressed at the end of the book here. Lord, we want our church to be full of commendations, Lord, not condemnation, not rebuke, not in need of repentance, Lord. Lord, please help us. Spur us on. Encourage us, Lord. Help us to grow. Help us to respond to Your Word. Help us to be faithful doers of it, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.